Welcome to the first virtual event of the Global Arctic Mission Council of Arctic Circle. This event consists of two parts, dialogue on the global Arctic today, geopolitical stability, uh, power politics, uh, fossil economy, focus on science and an urgency for climate change mitigation. And second, uh, the launch of Arctic Yearbook 2020, climate change and the Arctic, uh, global origin, uh, regional responsibilities. There are several uh, narratives, images, perceptions, and discourses on the Arctic. Among them, uh, or the global Arctic, initiated by the Global uh, Arctic Project 2014. Since then, it has been mentioned and discussed by several experts, scholars, and policymakers. The project uh, teamed up with Arctic Circle to jointly establish a global Arctic Mission Council as an open interactive international platform and network of experts of different fields and disciplines, as well as a process for clear thinking uh, across uh, sectors and beyond national borders. The Council aims first to combine the global local perspectives by interpreting the global Arctic as a new geopolitical context and replacing the Arctic within the context of global changes uh, and their worldwide implications. Second, to implement transdisciplinarity uh, uh, by uh, promoting open discussion between different stakeholders, having a policy relevant research agenda, building a network of experts and producing new strategic research capacity for a resilient Arctic and problem solving. The team of today's dialogue is designed to be topical and with holistic approach, as well as indicate the current situation of the Arctic by fo focusing relevant issues and their global implications. This year, the world saw the coronavirus become a global uh, crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, focused uh, the uh, authorities to uh, make uh, exceptional decisions, close the borders, uh, threatened modern societies, uh, and also to have people stay at home, as well as saving energy resources and time, and for a while decreasing CO2 emissions. And first of all, uh, allocating new investments for a Green Deal, uh, indicating that the original big problem uh, should not be isolated to wait until the termination of the virus, but should be part of the exit strategy. Here, the global Arctic plays a double role. Uh, as a victim and warning of rapid change, as well as an uh, interdisciplinary uh, workshop for research on climate, the environment, as well as uh, alternative covenants and seek for a paradigm shift. I have a pleasure to introduce the speakers of today's dialogue, all experts on the field and members of the Global Arctic Mission Council. Mia Christensen, Professor of Media and Communication at Royal Institute of Technology, 
Sweden. Her topic is power, politics, and public sphere. Heather Exner Pierrot, managing editor of the Arctic Yearbook, PhD in political sciences from uh, Canada. Her topic is Arctic and fossil fuels, the complexities of a transition uh, at a regional level. And Matthias Finger, Professor Emeritus on governance and regulations at EPFL. His topic is Arctic urgency. Is an urgency being perceived as the Arctic is rapidly warming and by whom? And I am Lassi Heinonen, Professor Emeritus. Uh, I'm the chair of the Mission Council and will moderate this uh, event. The procedure is simple. First, the speakers will have short presentations for two, five uh, minutes each, and then we have open discussion with questions and answers. So let's start. And I will ask Mia to take the floor, please. Thank you, Lassi. Uh, to begin, I would like to thank the organizers of the Arctic Circle Assembly for this opportunity to speak here today. It is one of the benefits, uh, I should say, of modern te communications technology that we can gather here today in this way, despite what is going on in the world. Um, let me begin with the title of my talk, Power Politics, Power Politics and the Public Sphere. Rather than thinking of this as power politics, a term borrowed from international relations, it could also be uh, more accurate perhaps to say that I would like to discuss power, comma, politics, and the public sphere. My goal in this short presentation is to provide some starting points and suggestions for how we might think about the relationship between media, power, and the issues facing the Arctic today. It is also my goal to perhaps add a little complexity to that relationship. Traditionally, media have been seen as intermediaries between power brokers and the general population, as channels through which the powerful could convey their messages and also as channels through which the powerful could, via critical journalism, be monitored on behalf of citizens. In this conception, power was primarily located in the hands of those possessing military, economic, or political power, namely governments and large corporations. While media were seen as key in terms of their communication dissemination, they were still considered primarily as vehicles, as purveyors of information or as conveyors of information. It is this conception of media's role in power that we must adjust or reconsider. Media should not be seen as mere intermediaries in the relationship with states, corporations, and citizens. They must be seen as power brokers in their own right. If there is one lesson that we should learn from the United States elections that took place last week, uh, it is that we can only understand events in the United States if we understand the complexity of the US media ecosystem. And of course, this goes for many other contexts and countries. The clear and pervasive fragmentation of the US news media audience, the rise of hyper-partisan media, and the role of powerful social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter tell us that a traditional understanding of the media as being large-scale national outlets like the New York Times or CNN are outdated and unhelpful. In addition, we must also recognize that many media organizations around the world not only support power, are literally economically intertwined with power. They are power. Media coverage isn't just in someone else's interest. Media coverage is often in economic interest. Central to understanding the complexity of this new media landscape is the role of social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and others, uh, which are a major force in shaping how news in both produced, how news is both produced and consumed globally and locally. Citizens increasingly use these platforms to access news and information with profit maxim maximizing algorithms sorting content before it reaches our home pages, our computers. Politicians and corporations are using platforms such as Facebook and Twitter to bypass traditional media 
and reach out to citizens and consumers directly, further fragmenting audiences. So how do we tie this back to uh, the issues and concerns expressed by so many here at uh, the Arctic Circle Assembly? To questions of climate change, uh, to questions related with resources extraction, to questions related with indigenous rights, the way to tie it back, I would say, is to consider these issues of complexity in relation to media and how they might be leveraged to promote a more progressive and solutions-oriented role for the media. Uh, three suggestions spring to mind, and I will uh, outline them very briefly. First, we must recenter the local that is lost in a great deal of the discussion of the media internationally is the role of the regional and local press. This includes newspapers, radio and television, as well as other uh, media and communication channels, more uh, not, uh, ones that we cover under the heading of new media. Regional and local media have suffered in recent years due to the restructuring of media markets and dim diminishing advertising revenue. The COVID-19 outbreak has made the crisis all the more acute, yet local media provide regional voice to planetary issues social media platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, while problematic, can act as important hubs and networks for indigenous communities, local media, and activists. We allow local media to die at our own peril, and we should not. I see this is the first uh, point I would like to make. We should go beyond uh, inward-looking elitism. Uh, while opinion in major newspapers matter, a lot of the audience or the readers are not found there. And thirdly, we should uh, develop a much stronger connection between research and local communities in order to create a synergy effect where the total is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, I think uh, climate change coverage suffered a lot in the United States, especially from uh, the notion of balance that is uh, giving equal time and space to uh, different views on the climate change uh, issue. But I think we need to reconsider that and, and, and give equal time, uh, I mean, uh, due time, uh, so to say, uh, to issues that are of relevance and importance to the public sphere and, and to the publics in general. So. Okay, thank you, Mia. Thank you for then we listening. will take Heather, please. It's a good segue from, from Mia's uh, presentation. She wants to add some complexity to simple messaging and how the media portrays the Arctic. And that's what I intend to do with this short presentation on fossil fuels. I think we have very superficial um, discussions on the Arctic and, and oil, and I think it's uh, kind of underserved kind of the policy intents that we need to have. Uh, so three points. One is that uh, I think the economic role of oil has already been declining in the Arctic, which I'm not sure everyone appreciates. And as you know, we're launching the Arctic Yearbook today. Olivia Lee has some uh, good research on this in this year's volume. One is that the Norwegian production has already been declining since the early 2000s. Uh, Alaskan production peaked in the late 1980s. Uh, Canadian and Greenlandic production was never really a thing. I was always very minimal. So the only place where we're really seeing more oil and gas production in the Arctic right now is in Russia. And this too is concentrated in LNG, uh, especially Yamal LNG, um, which from some perspectives, some carbon emissions perspectives, uh, you know, if this is going to be displacing coal in Asia, this isn't uh, a wholly terrible thing. Uh, so just appreciating that there isn't an Arctic oil boom happening. There has not been an Arctic oil boom happening. Um, and framing, you know, better understanding that as part of the discussion. The second thing is that an energy transition is going to be harder in the Arctic than other areas for a few reasons. One is that the Arctic is colder. Uh, it has obviously a dark season. Uh, and so there's a need for more heat and light. So just by definition, people need more energy um, in their daily lives. And it has to be reliable. Uh, if you don't have reliable energy, it could be, you know, you could be it's, you know, it's very cold. It could be a real problem. Uh, the other thing is that uh, many remote areas really rely on fossil intensive, you know, transportation methods and fuel sources. Uh, that's just, that's just how the system is. And so flying for transportation, flying in um, goods, food, uh, services, medical travel, it's very uh, carbon intense kinds of ways of logistics and transportation. And of course, many remote areas are also, re especially in Canada, uh, reliant on diesel. And there are alternative energy sources, but it's still a fact um, for many places. Uh, I think 
there's lots of discussion, I think lots of work going on on looking at renewable or lower carbon emission sources. So hydro, geothermal, biomass are all good solutions uh, for many different places. Uh, but those aren't perfect solutions of, of energy from an environmental perspective either. Um, I think it's difficult. Sometimes we conflate non-renewable with carbon-free. Of course, biomass, as an example, does have carbon emissions. Um, hydro produces a lot of environment impacts. It's not hydro is not you know universally accepted uh, across the Arctic. There's been lots of uh, debates and discussions and problems with hydro. Um, and, and so there you know there's there there are not perfect alternative solutions. And finally, I think we need to think about the economic contributions that oil has historically made for some Arctic regions. And, you know, whether based on, on policy or simply the market, I think oil and gas will play a smaller role in the Arctic economy going forward. Um, but we need, to, we need to think about what are some, you know, how do we respond to that? How, does the, how do Arctic economies respond to that? And first thing is I think we need to stop conflating economic development in the Arctic as corporate greed, as multinational corporations, as shell. Um, people deserve economic development. Economic development is a human right. And so we need to think carefully about if it's not going to be oil and gas, and I think it probably won't be, what is it going to be? Um, people, Indigenous and Northern nations need revenues to be more self-determining. Oil and gas has been very attractive uh, to provide those revenues, to buy those government uh, revenues. Uh, and something will need to replace them. Um, so some of the more, you know, and, and again, the alternatives aren't super either in terms of, you know, mining is still an extractive uh, activity. Um, fishing, uh, obviously, you know, it's kind of a zero sum game and that may be a source of some tension in the future too. Um, and Aushagen in our Arctic Yearbook volume talks about that. Um, and at any rate, um, resource development in general is a high intense uh, activity, often industrial activity. And so even in our friends in, in the Nordics, uh, where they tend to do much better than we do in North America in terms of carbon emissions, still their northern areas produce four or five times the amount of carbon e uh, emissions as their southern areas do. And so it just goes to show even, even with maybe more policy intent, more political will, um, the nature of Arctic economies and the nature of Arctic uh, societies is that right now they're fairly carbon intense. And so all this is by way of saying, as Lassie often does, that this is a wicked problem. Uh, and so we can't, you know, kind of have superficial slogans and just ask for more political will. We have to be a lot smarter than that, which is, uh, you know, a lot of people are working on it. But um, I don't expect Northerners to embrace higher energy costs. Um, especially when a lot of them already have, you know, lower household income. I don't expect them to embrace less reliable energy. I don't expect them to embrace a smaller, less competitive economy. And so we need to work on, you know, on balancing that with kind of global demands for, um, you know, basically reducing the Arctic uh, as more of an environmental um, kind of a region. So finally, uh, just to say, there's limited bandwidth in human and, and financial capacity in the Arctic. And I don't think they can absorb all the impacts of mitigating climate change, as well as all the impacts of adapting to climate change. Uh, and, and so just having a more balanced discussion about what is a reasonable uh, burden uh, to put on the Arctic region in this kind of global warming debate uh, is a good conversation to have. Thank you, Heather. And then Matthias, please. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Lassie, and thanks for having me here. Um, I will start with uh, global warming, uh, not climate change. Uh, the reality is global warming. And of course, global warming does not originate in the Arctic, but the Arctic is proportionately much more affected uh, than the rest of the planet by global warming. Uh, there are already huge consequences in the Arctic, but I don't want to go into that here. My point is really about uh, the global Arctic, the link between the Arctic and the Earth systems. And we, we know the consequences um, of the, a warming Arctic on the global system. I was focused on the three main aspects. Uh, the ice cover, the diminishing ice cover, loss of albedo effect, and you know the the tip the Arctic as a tipping point for the global climate. The second element um, is the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, 
which will lead to consequences in ocean currents and other big tipping point for the, for the planet. And the third element is permafrost thawing, methane released, release positive feedbacks, the acceleration uh, of global warming worldwide, not just in the Arctic. All this is well known. Uh, <clears throat> But the point I want to make here, and I think hopefully we'll have discussions about that, is it does not seem to bother many people, <clears throat> except for the experts, some experts on Earth system science, some global, uh, global, uh, globally oriented academics. The international community is still talking about two things. Uh, development, resources and development, and, and Heather just spoke to that. And when it comes to the Arctic and they're, they're speaking about geopolitics, that's what sort of it's talk about internationally. Uh, the Arctic community, if there is something like an Arctic community, uh, still seems to think, uh, and I would challenge that, still seems to think that sustainable development of the Arctic is actually possible. I think the situation will be much more dramatic uh, uh, and making sustainable development impossible. At national level, uh, the discourse is even more pro-development, even more pre prevalent. And the people who really suffer in the Arctic, the indigenous peoples, they don't really have a voice. They're not audible. So my question is, how much more will it take to end denial? Thanks. Thank you all very much for excellent uh, presentations. And then uh, we will turn uh, to the questions. So there is um, Angela George. You are asking, is the world informed enough about the global effects of a changing Arctic? I would like to address this uh, first to Matthias. I don't know what the world is. <laughs> you know, the people who want to, there is enough information about <laughs> the global effects of a warming or a changing Arctic, uh, but does the world want to know, really? <laughs> um, of course, the mainstream media and all that is not, and I just said, I mean, the, 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 the states, the international community is not really alerting to the fact, but if we really want to know, I think we have, it, we have in, enough information. And then maybe we can make the link to, uh, to Mia, you know, what would it take for the media? I think the media have a responsibility here. It's not just the academics. And, and I'm, I'm also critical about the academics. I mean, it's just a fraction of the academics that really knows about the, con the consequences on, on, on the globe. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I can turn it over to, to me. I think the, pro the problem is, yes, the, I mean, the answer to your question is, no, people don't know yet, but, but I, would, I use this word denial. Do they really want to know? Okay, thank you. Mia, would you like to add something? Yes, absolutely. Um, people do know what reaches their uh, computers, their uh, iPhones, etc. And I think we have a problem there because for years we had this uh, problem of parachute journalism that is reporting from the Arctic by big media only uh, a number of years and about like things that were of uh, significance to the media, but mm -hmm. not local and regional reporting. But I also would like to add uh, happily that with uh, regional media in the Arctic, with also infrastructure and connectivity rising in the region, uh, outlets such as Arctic Today are gaining prominence. So we are getting more on-site uh, news from the Arctic itself. Are we there yet? Are we there in terms of like a balanced reporting of the Arctic and, and people um, achieving information in terms of uh, what is happening in the Arctic? rather than polar bears and the sea ice minima uh, that are measured twice a year that we see in the big media a lot. No, we're not there yet, but I, I, I do see uh, progress. I do see development there, yeah. Okay, thank you. I can add based on the recently published uh, uh, comprehensive analysis of uh, Arctic policies and strategies that at least the policy shapers and makers, makers they know the problem. And that's why uh, there is focus on science in these uh, documents, but 
there is another uh, then then there is a problem and that is the paradox that that they they like matthias said they they will not turn that into action so they they, they are hesitating to make the, the hard decisions but they know that there is a problem thank you so let's take the second question please uh, by Sandra Maria Raducas Palau from Lisboa. Can we expect big changes in steady and effective climate change mitigation policies from the new US administration? So maybe we should ask that from Heather next door, the USA. What do you would Heather say? Well, according to Pompeo, we may not have a, a, a new U.S. administration, uh, but we're all keeping our it fingers is crossed. The new U.S. administration. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, obviously, I think it'll be better on climate change policy than a Republican administration. Um, and in terms of what you might see concretely, um, you know, I look at the Arctic Council a lot. I think if there had been another Trump administration, uh, the Arctic Council would have withered on the vine for about four more years. And so it, from that perspective, there's much more opportunity for regional cooperation on some of these things, uh, probably more uh, opportunity for investment in science research, um, you know, collaborative approaches, that kind of a thing. Uh, but, and I, and I still, I'll go back to the last question um, and challenge Matthias and Lassie a little bit. This is a, a wicked problem. I don't, it's not that policymakers don't know. It's not that the world doesn't know. It's not that we don't have good science. We have that. It's that there are consequences to, to transitioning from a fossil fuel economy. It means changing all of our logistics, changing our transportation, changing the way that we consume things. And people, I think, understand that and are saying, geez, that's a lot of sacrifice to make for the consequences of climate change. So I don't think it's a matter of ignorance. I think it's a cost benefit analysis that the average person makes and isn't yet convinced that their life would be better without fossil fuels than it would be with fossil fuels in terms of what the technology that I have, we have today. And so if a US administration, you know, and there's lots to criticize in the United States, but of course they've always been extremely excellent at entrepreneurship, technology, research and development, getting things on the market. If there's anything that this US administration could do for the positive, it would be to accelerate those technological solutions so that people can maintain their quality of life uh, you know, maintain all the all the positives, uh, kind of that the industrial revolution has brought to societies uh, while reducing carbon emissions. Thank you, uh, Mia Matthias. Would you like to add something to this question? Yeah, I think we we have an interesting discussion, <laughs> um, Heather. I don't think there is a techno fix. I think technology helps. It will buy us more time, but. We, it will not fundamentally get us out of the dynamics in which we are already are. Ultimately, we need a lifestyle change. And then I'm with you, Heather. You know, are people ready for that? Okay. Yeah. Matthias, Any? thank you. Uh, Matthias, you crit crystallized my thoughts succinctly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, there is no technological fix for this. Yes, it might sort of uh, buy us some time but it is a total uh, lifestyle change. And, and when we look at the media scene and communication uh, channels, yes, of course, we see an enthusiasm for technological solutions because it sells, right? It's, it's, it makes it more interesting for the audiences to read and consider. But I think what we need is uh, way more than that. We need a lifestyle yeah. change, uh, totally. And okay, well, and, and what, what the new US administration would, would play here? I mean, I guess we will have a new administration there. It's sort of like uh, two steps forward, five steps steps backwards. I mean, with Obama, we had we were they were part of uh, the Paris Accord. Now all that's going to happen is that they're going to go back to that if if we have uh, Biden. Mm. So um, of course it's a step in the right direction, but nevertheless it's a, it's a, I mean there is a time issue here. Um, okay. This is not regardless no, of time. If I, if I may, ask it just one thing. As well, as well, very briefly. We yeah. have no. It's certainly uh, the new administration going to be a, a step in the right direction. Uh, it it will change the discourse. I mean, we we should totally su support this. But the challenges are huge, and we have lost four years. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, thank you. So there are two questions, uh, both from Daria Tarkova from Lund University about ownership. So first, can thinking of the Arctic as uh, 
as an area belonging to itself uh, and indigenous peoples revolutionize natural resource management. So I think that this goes, I would like to address this to Heather. Yeah, thank you. I, I love that question. Um, and in Canada, and I work a lot on this, we have seen indigenous management of resource development uh, increasingly. And one thing I've noticed, and I don't think this is a negative, but Indigenous peoples are taking over more resource development projects, having greater employment in, uh, partnership in, equity in, and increasingly even ownership. Um, and we just saw a huge you know, fishing deal just, just last week uh, on the East Coast, but we are seeing Indigenous groups trying to buy pipelines um, and, and some in groups even uh, getting an equity stake in Keystone. Uh, for Indigenous nations in the prairies in Canada. So what I am seeing is that when Indigenous peoples have the opportunity to engage more in resource development, benefit economically from resource development, the answer usually isn't to not conduct or not explore or not partake in resource development. It's to do it in a way that benefits their communities and their societies much more. Uh, and so in terms of the Arctic, do I think that there are probably knock on, yes, there will be higher standards or best standards uh, or additional considerations of what is important in the environment to monitor and to protect. Uh, but I don't think it means no resource development because those indigenous nations generally want more self-determination from kind of the, the states on which they're often dependent. Uh, and so I do see indigenous peoples taking over more resource management, resource development. I don't think that's a bad thing, but if they're going to be competitive in a global environment, they still largely have to pay by the same rules. Okay, thank you. So the question is uh, again by Daria Tarkova. Who does the Arctic belong to? Is it right that powerful nations negotiate the use of the Arctic? Okay. We will start. Uh, yeah, just two points. The first one is, you know, on the previous on the previous question, the link. You know, it, uh, resources, the, the resources for the indigenous people. How much oil does the indigenous community need in the Arctic? You know, I mean, it, it, are they using the, the 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 oil for themselves, which is, I think, fine, or are they using to make money and become? That's the link to the other question to become like a second Saudi Arabia or something like that, that's not okay. And uh, I think that that's where we have to put in the global responsibility of the whole thing. I mean, it's not, it's just, it's like the Amazon rainforest or something like that. Can people, can, can the people there decide to, pray to, to burn it down? All these things now have planetary consequences. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that the superpowers have to decide about the Arctic, but it's somehow a collective uh, decision. Thank you. Mia, would you like to? Mm -hmm. Yes, That's I would it. like to add to that and, and, and very much uh, continue on that uh, note of planetary, uh, as I've been mentioning uh, quite a few times actually in my research as well. This is a planetary issue. Um, yes, the Arctic, who does it belong to? We can have like another uh, 10 hours, maybe 10 days of uh, discussions about this. Obviously, we have Arctic states, the Arctic Council, who's uh, governing uh, certain issues, and more and more number of emergent uh, actors that are entering the scene. Um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an arena, a tension field of negotiations, both cooperation. We should also mention that there has been cooperation and peace for a long time, but we are also seeing uh, signs of uh, rising tensions in the, in the region as well. So who does it belong to? That's not an easy answer to give, but nevertheless, I think it is really important to understand what is going on in terms of the power play, in terms of power politics and how that is, how that is being uh, reflected in, in the public sphere in terms of uh, how uh, the publics around the globe are understanding this. But I think I would emphasize the importance and role of the planetary, and I would like to put it in quotation marks, over the global, because this is um, a supreme uh, importance issue that is affecting the planet and all of us, all the species, not only humans uh, that are residing on this, on this uh, earth. Thank you. Then we will take the next question, and that is by Rasmus Perpelsen from uh, University of Tromsø. How does a global energy system affect the Arctic when USA, Russia, Saudi Arabia compete for the Chinese energy market? I mean, yes, I mean, they are, there is competition. They are competing about the resources, you know. 
Um, but I understand, you know, the U.S. companies, Russian companies, South Aramco competing for the Chinese market, okay? Uh, and, and there, I think, if, if that's what is meant, you know, that's, that's purely economics in the sense uh, who produces more cheaply uh, with demand and supply. You know, for so far, uh, Saudi Aramco has still the cheapest production costs, so they will get the, they will get it. But, but if the demand rises, you know, then at some point, exploitation of the oil in the Arctic will become lucrative. But I, I'm also with Heather. I follow Heather on this. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, Oil, uh, oil is going to be the big, big thing in the Arctic. We will run into the global problems far earlier than we can start exploiting the oil uh, in the Arctic. Okay, thank you. Heather. Yeah, I'll, again, Matthias, we're both agreeing on this issue, which is nice. Uh, but this is, uh, for me, this is purely a market uh, discussion. And the Arctic right now is not competitive. And it's hard to see the Arctic being competitive in terms of expanding what already exists because there are so many oil and gas um, you know, projects, plays that are under underutilized right now. There could be a lot more extraction out of the oil sands. There could be a lot more out of shale, out of fracking in the United States. And so, you know, in fact, just yesterday or this week, the Northwest Territories announced they wanna do a feasibility study on gas, on LNG coming out of Tukta Yuktuk. And that sounds nice, but to me, there's, there's no market. I don't see a, a market potential for that kind of a project. Uh, when there's so many more, you know, in, in facilities invested in that are under under supplying right now. Okay, thank you. Then we will take uh, the uh, next two questions together. They both are dealing with science, and both are by Achel Nilsson uh, from Runnis and the University of Iceland. So first part is what is the role of science in the governance of the Arctic region, and what are the most significant contributions by outside stakeholders to Arctic science and research cooperation? Maybe Heather will start. Yeah, I can start. Um, this is my perspective and I'm a social scientist, so I'm probably biased, is that there is far too, there's a huge imbalance of focus on environmental and natural uh, sciences in the Arctic and a real uh, problem with providing better social science and humanities uh, research in the Arctic. And, and that probably contributes to kind of the incredible policy focus on climate change and environmental protection versus human development. Uh, I know they're linked. I'm not, you know, trying to separate them, but I'm saying, you know, we know almost nothing about e Arctic economies. And if you want to move away from the extractive industries, then we need a lot more thinking uh, and a lot more possibilities on, on how you have a more sustainable economy, if Matthias says, if that's even possible. And so for me, um, we could be doing a lot better and a lot more if we focus more on social sciences. And again, like you say, uh, Eagle, on, on translating that knowledge into governance and into policy. Uh, but right now, I think, you know, I think we have the environmental impacts of climate change on the Arctic pretty well known. I don't think, I don't think a lack of knowledge there is what is hampering policy in that area. Thank you. Who will yeah. continue? If, if I, I may. I, oh, I, Matthias, please. Yeah, may. If, I, if I may. Um, I, which science? You see, the, the problem I see is that science is highly fragmented. <laughs> You know, there, there. You, you, you know, when you have the anthropologists and you, you have the, the the system sciences and the glaciologists and 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 none of them. That's a, it's not an Arctic problem. It's a problem of the scientific scientific community, which basically is not capable to to link all these dots that are being assembled from different corners, and there is no real institution that is capable to make all these links. So. I, I would even be as provocative as to say, we don't need more science. Uh, we know enough. Uh, what we need is to link these things together. And uh, to the second question, science is global. It doesn't matter whether it's people in the Arctic or anywhere, this is global science. So anybody is welcome um, to make, to link the dots. Thank you, Mia. I would like to add to that also, let's see, yes, that was one of the points I tried to make in my uh, talk as well. We need interdisciplinarity. I think we are at a point, like Matthias is saying, I very much agree with that we have enough science and we have enough science to point to what is happening, we just don't enough, 
cooperation perhaps or understanding to the dots and to present what is happening, uh, what is about to happen from a multidisciplinary perspective. And I think that that, that should be um, in our focus, so it, at least from an academic perspective, but also from a societal perspective, definitely, yes. Okay, thank you. So by Stephanie Russell, uh, what is the role of observers such as the EU, China and other Asian states in the global Arctic? Anybody? Observers are ob observers are observers. Okay. They're not actors. Well, I mean, this they is act behind, but they don't act as part of the Arctic Council, and that's the problem. I mean, I agree. The EU is it, it, the EU should have a bigger role than observer. China should have a big. It's a global problem. The main global actors should somehow participate in the governance of it, not just be observers. Okay. Well, I can I can uh, add that that yes, exactly. The, the 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 main and only task of observer states in the Arctic Council is to observe. But but then of course, when it comes to the EU, it has big impact there because of its supporting Arctic uh, research, because of climate change negotiations and uh, uh, fisheries. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Uh, last yeah, I'm going to interject on that question well, too, if you very don't mind. Briefly. Very because briefly, yeah. So we, we, you know, we talk about observers in the Arctic Council as if the Arctic Council is the only game in town, as if yeah. it's the only source of governance in the Arctic region, and that's the mistake. So are, is China and the EU and other non-Arctic countries involved in Arctic governance? Of course they are through the United Nations Law of the Sea. The Fisheries Agreement was, you know, very much involved. Everyone who had a stake. Climate change, environmental protection, research. Um, so I, I don't see any problem. The Arctic Council very much deals with, you know, Arctic specific region things, uh, but that's not to say that these other heavy players, um, geopolitical actors are not involved in Arctic governance in other ways. So I don't see a problem there. Yeah, okay, thank you. Then uh, we have to take the, the next one uh, by Christina Pengchen. Do you see more nations claim the status of a near Arctic state as China has done? How will that affect? Arctic covenants. I, I, I do the provocative statement again. Every state is near the Arctic state with the, with the global consequences of what is going in the Arctic. Somalia is affected. Uh, Mali is affected. Uh, so they are all now, should they all be observers or that's another question, but, but uh, uh, there are no near and far. We are all near. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I will Mia, yes. interject there as well. Yes, I very much agree with that because it, it, it depends on what scale of uh, change and transformation we're looking at. If, if you're looking at climate change, absolutely. It is a planetary phenomenon. It affects Somalia as much as it does uh, Sweden, Finland, and all the other Arctic states that have a uh, uh, region in that, that territory. But also in terms of uh, what is happening commercially, financially, with the opening of the... Um, uh, melting away of the Arctic sea ice, of course, we are seeing sort of a more uh, immediate entrance into the into the game, and I think we will continue to do so. Um, I mean, this year's uh, Arctic sea ice minimum was significant, wasn't it, in terms of uh, indicating further changes in that in that arena of uh, power game. So okay. we cannot look at a crystal ball and predict, okay, who are going to be the next, but definitely it's, it's, it's an issue and it is, a, it is to be paid attention to. And I, th I think that was an excellent question in that way. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I can add that, uh, well, I most probably the, the, the question or the, the person behind the question uh, was meaning ge geography. And, and there are certainly those uh, in addition of China uh, UK and, and, and Scotland, for example. But then, of course, like the idea of the Global uh, Arctic Mission Council is that, that what are the worldwide implications of, of, of uh, global changes in the Arctic? So, so then all, all states of the Earth are nearby or affected by. Okay, then it's time to take the last one. How will the Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council impact the Global Arctic by Margaret Sella uh, from University of Iceland. Heather will start. For me, it, it offers tremendous potential. And that's because in the Arctic Council, you have eight states and two of them 
our superpowers in the region, United States and Russia. And if we, and I think the Arctic Council is ripe for some reform. Uh, I don't think it's 1990s uh, mission and mandate and structure is serving it well in the, the 2020s. And I only think a heavy hitter like Russia um, and the United States um, are able to really push that reform. And so, and, and I'll say this, you know, uh, Lavrov has more institutional memory about the Arctic Council than probably anyone else in the world. He's been in all those ministerial meetings. He knows the Arctic Council very well. He knows the value it can have for Russia. Uh, and this is a really great opportunity for Russia to portray itself as a productive leader uh, in international affairs, which I think it probably craves. And so I think there is opportunity for it to be more ambitious than it has been um, you know, in recent history. And I'm looking forward to it and I hope they get their act together and I hope they do constructive things. Thank you. Any other would like to add something? Russia is a big chunk of the Arctic, the biggest chunk of the Arctic and Russia has to take responsibility on the Arctic. And in that sense, it is good that they are put in a position of responsibility. Yes, and I can add to that from the public sphere uh, and communication and mediation point of view that uh, we need to receive more information, more accurate information from the Russian Arctic. Obviously, they hold the uh, they have the biggest uh, share of the Arctic shore, um, and this has been debated greatly. There have been problems with that uh, in terms of knowing what is going on um, and how information that is reaching the global uh, publics um, is being filtered. I mean, that is coming from, the, uh, coming from Russia is, a, is an issue. Um, and I think added to that is, is this uh, current situation with the United States, not knowing uh, what's gonna happen in terms of who's gonna take office uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very, very, very interesting and um, um, highly complex issue, the Russian chairmanship. Of the of the Arctic, yes. Okay. We have Thank high you. expectations at the same time. A lot yeah. of questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, answers, and uh, I, I I really uh, thank the the persons making excellent uh, questions for us. So this this is exactly the pre uh, precondition for a lively discussion. So now we will come to the end of the first part of the virtual event and, and have the second part. The second part is the uh, launch of the Arctic Yearbook 2020. It is uh, our, the editor's pleasure and honor to launch the Arctic Yearbook 2020, uh, climate change and uh, the Arctic global origins, uh, regional responsibilities with 23 scholarly peer-reviewed articles and eight briefing notes and commentaries widely covering the team. Peer-reviewed uh, scholarly articles analyze climate change from science and policy viewpoints with emphasis on Arctic geopolitics and resources, discuss the role of Arctic Council in climate change mitigation, and in particular, particular have indigenous and gender aspects of Arctic climate change in focus. When we decided this year's theme with uh, its two-dimensional uh, nature, first recognizing the global origin of climate change with the Arctic as a workshop for climate uh, research, and second, discussing possible responsibilities and uh, problem solving from the regional point of view, we did not know what was coming. I mean, the current situation because of the pandemic forcing uh, to consider globalization's uh, dark side by new premises of security, non-military threats that should be applied comprehensively. And it also supports the importance of scientific research and its applications, digitalization, distance learning, distance working, and open access material for knowledge building, such as the Arctic Yearbook, when trying to solve global crisis and wicked problems. Altogether, more than 190 peer-reviewed scholarly articles, more than 130 briefing notes and commentaries in nine volumes since 2012, with diversity of different themes. This makes 
the Arctic Yearbook as a leading international Arctic peer-reviewed journal in a few fields, such as international relations, IR, Arctic shipping, state policies, and the Arctic Council. Due to an open access nature, these articles uh, in these nine volumes share Arctic social science research far beyond the halls of academia, receiving tens of thousands of reads. An active social media presence, more than 4,000 uh, followers, has allowed the yearbook to further disseminate Arctic research to new audiences. We could hardly, hardly consider that the Arctic yearbook would be such a perfect platform for this kind of exceptional situation, when everything is put online and where there is a lot of mis- and disinformation. As an international interdisciplinary online journal with open access, the Arctic yearbook provides accessible, reliable information in a sea of paywalled articles and internet meets. The yearbook's application, peer review, and copy edit processes are truly author centered. Many early career scientists, postdocs, PhD candidates, and senior uh, researchers appreciate the yearbook due to the rich variety of themes and its style, nature, fast peer review process, as well as visibility on social media. All this is an achievement as the yearbook published by the U University of the Arctic Thematic Network on Geopolitics and Security has run a voluntary efforts since its initiation. Big thanks to Arctic Portal's invaluable role in hosting the website. Instead, the application is built on several strengths as preconditions for uh, success, a kind of philosophy behind expertise, networking or based on individuals, willingness and capabilities, and encouragement at innovations. All this has allowed the yearbook to remain independent, quick and flexible, and focused on publishing new uh, research findings, rather than uh, being occupied with seeking funding. All in all, the Arctic yearbook consistently provides high quality, peer reviewed articles from diverse researchers of Arctic social science and the humanities. It is an idea, initiative and institution an issue driven by experts that deserves to be recognized and used by Arctic communities, as well as a, perf per a perf perfect platform on local global for the current state of the world that deserves to be used by global audience. It is, briefly saying, one of the most innovative and successful stories in Arctic research in the last 10 years. We welcome you to have a look at the online contents of the 2020 Arctic Yearbook and enjoy the readings. We are looking forward to hearing from you in the future. It's time to, to, to close this event. I, I, I thank you all for uh, being present and actively uh, participating in, uh, first of all, the, the, the speakers and those who have sent the questions. The Arctic uh, Circle would like to draw up your attention to its next virtual event on Wednesday next week. Sweden's Minister for uh, Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency uh, Anne Linde, will speak about Sweden's uh, new uh, Arctic policy and its geopolitical implications. Former Foreign Minister of Iceland, Osur uh, Stephenson, will be moderating the event. Registration is open on the Arctic Circle's website. Thank you once more for today, and please, Stick around for the video presenting this next event.